Okay, so we're going to get started now. My name is Doug Cogswell. I'm the president and CEO of Advisor Solutions. We're a data analytics and services software company that's been working in the fundraising sector for about 12 years. Uh, we've done a bunch of work across higher ed, healthcare, not for profit. And today we're going to share some of our experience in how to segment prospects and create some attachment scores and, and, and uh, create strategies around what the data can be telling you. So there's going to be uh, three parts to this and then a QA. and a I'm going to start with a concept piece, which is a whiteboard session. Uh, that'll take about five minutes. Then we're going to dive in, look at how you use data in an actual scenario of major giving fundraising, where we're going to look at quadrant A prospects, high capacity, and also highly engaged who aren't staffed. And then work through the data to see if we can come up with some cultivation strategies for this group. This is sort of a lot of the coaching work we're doing with teams, and it's going really well. And then uh, after that, we're going to build and deploy an attachment model, uh, actually work through some real data and see how it goes, and then we'll have some time for a Q&A. So let's get started. I'm going to play uh, this pre-recorded concept piece on uh, segmenting. So let's take a look. Okay, so here's the deal. You've got a population of people. Let's, let's represent it by a circle, kind of a circle. And um, the idea here is you're trying to figure out who are the best prospects to solicit. And one dimension is capacity. And let's say we have capacity running from low to high. And that could be determined by wealth screens uh, using information from wealthy zip codes or whatever. And so you have some higher capacity prospects and some lower capacity prospects. Another dimension would be how engaged are the people uh, in your um, your operation, be it a higher education or a healthcare or a not-for-profit. So let's try to, how would we figure that out? Well, one way would be to do some modeling and create some segmentation. So one concept is the base population. In any model, uh, you need to have a base population that is what you're going to compare a target to. So in this case, if we're trying to find the best prospects, the base population should probably be people who have capacity. So this group over here, they have more capacity than the group over there. So then what you want to do is differentiate the people who have the capacity who have given from the people who have the capacity and haven't given. So let's say in this population, here are people, these dots, that have given at or above their capacity. And so in a modeling exercise, you would select the target, and then you would compare it to the base. And then the modeling is going to figure out what makes the target different than everybody else in the base. And that dimension is going to become, let's say, attachment. And that's going to run from high to low. Some people are going to be more engaged and more attached, some less. And the factors, the next thing is explanatory factors that go into the model. There's a bunch of stuff in your data that's going to indicate how engaged or how attached somebody is. And they're going to be things like uh, numbers of events attended in the last two years, you know, numbers of committees they participated on in the last five years. Numbers of both, numbers of uh, gifts the last five years. So the number of years they made a gift in the last five years. Maybe the number of you know, gifts, uh, you know, six to ten uh, years. Maybe number of reunions attended if you're, if you're higher ed. If you're healthcare, there's going to be another set of things. There's going to be what we call patient potential. And that's going to be... Uh, so this is like an advancement attachment, attachment, and then there's patient potential, which are going to be things like how many encounters have there been, numbers of encounters, last two years, you know, uh, area of last visit. There's a set of this stuff that's in your data that can be created into these explanatory factors and turned into a model that then scores the entire population from. Uh, high to low attachment. So now you have basically a, a segmentation structure here with this population. And what you want to do is this quadrant up here, call it quadrant A, are the people who have high capacity and are highly engaged. They're your best prospects to make a major gift. This group down here are highly engaged, uh, I mean not engaged, but have high capacity. So the goal would be to cultivate them figure out which of these factors they haven't done well on. Uh, maybe they haven't been to events, but they've been making gifts. Let's get them to some events and try to move them up into quadrant A. So quadrant B are the uh, people that you really want to cultivate and move up. 
Over here, you have lower capacity, but they're highly engaged. This quadrant, called quadrant C, we prime annual giving uh, prospects because you know, they have all the characteristics, but they don't have the capacity. And this quadrant is sort of a, more of a question mark, either low capacity and less engaged. And the last dimension you want to look at is uh, interest. So interest is the third dimension. And you can take the data, uh, maybe it's reunion surveys, or maybe it's which kinds of articles they're clicking on on the newsletters and segment it into maybe they're interested in athletics. Or maybe they're always clicking on the science articles. Or maybe they're always clicking on the social justice work that you're doing. So now you have uh, a segmentation structure with these quadrants and also the interest areas, which now helps you with the messaging. So let's jump into the software and take a look at how you do this. So I'm going to you know, swing into um, the scenario of looking at this quadrant A, which are the high capacity, in this case 500,000 up, versus the medium capacity, 100 to 500, the lower capacity, 25 to 100, who are scored as an engaged owner off an attachment model versus being disengaged or disconnected. And um, let me actually just jump into the software where it'll come live. And uh, let's run through a scenario. Um, and where we've got the data arranged is there's a series of pages. So we're looking at these ratings, and there's more detail on the, the capacity. You know, the, the high capacity are actually broken into one, two, three, four, five uh, subcategories. The, the red, the green is broken into two, and there's a couple at the lower. And these attachment groups, uh, engaged owner could be engaged, highly engaged owners, there's three levels, and then the dis disengaged, disconnected could be you know, disengaged or disconnected. And there's a list of people, and we're looking at 55,000 prospects uh, in this, um, this pool. And there's a set of pages we're going to run through. How are they staffed? Where they live? What's their affiliation? Biographical degrees, student sports, employment committees, giving history, gift details, attachment scores, and projected amounts. So we're going to hit several of these. But if I'm looking at this, and I want to drill in on this quadrant A up here, which has, looks like, uh, 3,237 people in it, I can click it. So when I click it, the numbers here show, and it shows know how they tile in against how many are in each of these capacity bands and how many are in each of these bands here. And I might want to make sure they're staffed because this is my prime group. So let's go to the staffing page, get rid of all the gray. So it looks like out of that group of 3,277, uh, there are 2,646 2, are staffed. Let's click them. Uh, here's the portfolio owners for that group. I'm actually looking at this, you know, typically we recommend um, portfolio sizes for major giving of 75 to 125. Several of these are pretty big. You may want to do some portfolio rebalancing because it looks like Megan's got 206, which is, you know, these are the, some of the best prospects. It's probably more than she can, she can appropriately cover. And if we had major giving metrics, we might see low penetration against her portfolio. We might see long times in some of the stages. This would manifest itself some other ways. There's a group here that's saying right where you'd like them to be. And this is just part of the overall uh, set of prospects. So these, these smaller uh, portfolios could have obviously others who are not in quadrant A in them. We actually want to look at the unstaffed one. So I'll click the no. There's 631 of them. Uh, let's go see where they live. Get rid of the rest. Yeah, they're kind of all over. I mean, there's a bunch up here in New York. Looks like there's another cl cluster up here in the Boston area. There's a group out here in the Bay Area, um, group down here in Florida. Hey, I just just realized my, my VP is going to Florida. So let's, uh, actually Miami, so let's just grab Florida and drill down a little bit. And here's a group that's around Miami. Um, so here's 24 prospects. Let's get rid of everybody else who are in Quadrant A, who aren't staffed and who live in the Miami area. Um, you know, they've... Some of them are given six figures. This is total lifetime commitment. There's a few five figures. Most of them haven't given very much. Let's go to this page. Uh, so this is where some of the analytics come to play. It's the 24 people. Uh, here's their total lifetime commitment, which you saw on the other chart. Here's a projected seven-year amount, which we're calculating. We're calculating it from the ratings. So this person's got a projected seven-year amount of four million. It's only given 4,000 total because they've attended a 50 million capacity. They're highly engaged with an attachment score of 0.19. They're highly engaged. Uh, 
because well, they haven't been on any committees, which this is actually the way we had this arranged. The, this, these columns are the ones that are most influential in creating attachment or engagement uh, to the lease. And then obviously there's a bunch of other stuff that doesn't, doesn't make the cut. But committees is the most influential. And um, Nyla uh, has not been on a committee, but she's made gifts in all five of the last five years. So this number could be zero, one, two, three, four, five. That's good. Five of the years before that, a reunion junkie, been to 13 reunions, um, didn't play any sports, but was on a student activity. And these are all the kinds of things. We'll show how we built the model in a little bit. But these are the kinds of things that help create connection and, and creates the potential or the likelihood of someone of equal capacity to give more of their money. And that reflects in these attachment scores. When I look at this list, I see a few things. I mean, you see this whole group's been giving pretty consistently, a couple of exceptions here. Um, they've been coming to a lot of reunions, um, some more than others. You know, there's, I can't really change the sport to student activities. But if I'm looking at this dinner, I'm realizing that the committees is the most influential thing, and most of these people haven't been on a committee. One of my strategies might be to, you know, get more of these people engaged on committees. And then I might say, well, here's, here's somebody, Paul. Paul Helmar has been on two committees. Let's click Paul, go to the committees page. Which committees? Let's just actually drop down to just Paul for a minute. So Paul's been on two committees in the last 10 years. Uh, these two, what are they? Looks like the reunion committee twice. So he's been on reunion committees, but you know, across the uh, the last, uh, you know, o overall he's been on uh, 10 committees. So he's been a class officer. So I'm getting some history. This guy's been really involved in his class, and you know, not surprising uh, that creates the score. Because the idea here was I'm using this as a cultivation strategy for the dinner I'm going to set up in Miami, and uh, it was a really quick cut to get this list. If I go back to the first page. And this is sort of more of the just the demographic details of the people. And I could explore the other pages and see if there's common affiliations or bio, but you no, know, I know they're, they're alums and, and kind of here's where they live. This could have addresses and not staff. We had some job uh, employment matching we did. We're trying to match out do they have C level jobs? A number of them do. Some of them we don't have employment data. You might want to go fill in that gap. And here's the detail from before. So this is an exportable list. So I can uh, drop it down out of here to my desktop and use it for my uh, my dinner list. So you can picture, um, that was a couple minutes, we had a, went through a list, uh, created a strategy, um, discussed the cultivation we're going to do, and we got our list down uh, into Excel. You know, this, this would have pulled from the CRM the night before, and now I have it in a format where I can give it to who's ever setting up this dinner, and, if this is real data, I could have had you know, the, the uh, actual email and phone numbers and go go set it up. So just you know, just picture trying to do that uh, kind of strategy on a regular basis is really, really pretty powerful to managing the overall portfolio and, and boosting results. And we could go back you know, to this page. If I go back to the beginning, uh, we probably want to look at this group and you know, make sure that they're being cultivated properly. Here's an in-between group where they're really engaged as a bit, a bit of a mid-level capacity, but probably do the same exercise there. So uh, I'm going to shift gears for a minute, and let's look at actually building the attachment scores. So I'm going to go to the giving history page, which has the capacity ratings of this group. And we're looking at uh, 55,000 people. Uh, they're all the ones with capacity over 25,000. We've uh, filtered out the other 39,000. So this is our population. They've got capacity, they've got giving. To build a model, uh, we need to have this concept of base population and target population. So uh, I'm just gonna make a, a judgment call that I want my base population to be everybody with a capacity of 250,000 or up. And that's gonna be my uh, group I'm gonna start with. Because my assumption is they have capacity, they should be able to make gifts at that level, and there's 13,911 of them. Great, let's get rid of everybody else. So from my target, I want to look at the people who have actually made a gift at that level, which is these three bars at the top. Uh, these people have you know, total, total giving of 500 to 1,000. They've got the capacity, but they haven't made the gifts. These people at the top have, there's 596 of them. So I've now selected my target against my base population. And we're going to use regression-based modeling to figure out which factors uh, 
cause this group to give it the levels they could and the other uh, group not. And uh, from a modeling perspective, you know, the target needs to be at least 0.5% of the base, which it clearly is because, uh, you know, percent of this is, is uh, 130 or so. So this is, this is like a 5%. I can quickly see the math there works. So to build a model, and this is using our software, there's obviously other ways to do this. I go to model, the top. I click model. I get a panel on the left. Let's make it a little bit bigger. Uh, I want to click uh, a new model because I haven't done this before. I have several things I need to do here. I need to name the model. So let's name it attachment. I need to uh, run it against a table. So there's a bunch of tables. Most of your CRMs have a bunch of tables. Um, you got you know, sports and activities. I want to put on the entity table. Now you could run it separately on the committee table. What that's going to do is going to look at one dimension, the committees by name. It's going to figure out some of those committees are more influential at creating large donors than others. Some actually could be negative. I mean, we've actually done some of this uh, in some cases, like interviewing high school students in an elite private school might actually be a negative. So if you run the model against all the factors, committees come out high, you probably also want to go back and run it against the committee's table because maybe they're not all the same and they should be grouped. So let's just, just for now, start on the entity table. We're going to start the model here. So I've got attachment name, table, and I have two kinds of models we can run, a re normal linear regression model, or if I click this, it becomes a classification model, which for this is set membership. So if I'm trying to forecast, you know, the top of a giving pyramid, it's really hard to do a linear regression model because it's a huge skew. There's a few people that gave huge gifts, and then it's, it's not, it's a hard thing to forecast. So this set membership or classification model generally works better for something like this, where I've got a group of people. I'm trying to see collectively what makes them different from everybody else. And then in the data, there's a bunch of explanatory factors. Uh, we'll show you where these come from because we have, you know, the committees table has how many committees they've been. You've got to sum it over 10 years. Gifts last five years, we're looking at the gifts table. Let's just uncheck these and bring these ones in because we created these. I'll show a calculation in a minute on things that could be potential influence factors for attachment, which is what we're looking at here. Um, this is a calculated number. There's other things we've turfed out of the data. You know, some things, there are too many things, the modeling won't let you use them and so forth. So here's my attachment factors. Now I want to go down here and I want to train the model. This will run pretty quick. We're running only against you know a few ten thousands of entities. So first thing I look at is over on the far right. Oh, let's get this a little more room. Uh, my concordance. So this runs from zero to one. If it's up at a hundred or zero to hundred, if it's a hundred, it's too high. The model's overfitted. If it's you know down under forty, it's too low. We color it green. So this is right in the band where the math thinks it, it predicted that target reasonably well, not overfitting, not underfitting. It created a, a ranking of the factors that matter. It thinks that numbers of committees that have been participated in the last 10 years explains 55% of the difference of the people who have given at or above that 250,000 didn't. Followed by how many reunions they've been to explains 20% roughly gifts in the last five years, so consistency of giving the six to 10 years back in sports. So this actually does make some sense. Now I would wanna be careful with the committees. Were these donors put on specific committees after they made their large gift, you would want to take that out because that's not a causal factor. That's a it's, a, it's a correlated factor. And the math is, can sometimes figure that out, but that's something that needs to be just tested. And if I saw this, I'd probably want to run another model just against the committee's table and get a feel for, are the committees all the same or do they vary? Maybe create a couple of bins out of it. And if I know that some of these committees are like, honor committees for large donors, I would want to remove them from the calculation. But let's assume this is good. Over here, it gives you some math. For example, one thing that's interesting is this committees has a positive factor. The more you're in, the more it matters, but it's a square root. What that means, if you're on one committee, it counts uh, this amount. If you're on two committees, it's not twice. It's like one point something times it. If you're on four committees, the square root of four is two. It's two times being on one. If you're nine committees, it's three times the, the, the weight of being on one. So this actually figures some stuff out here. It's not like 10 committees is 10 times more than one. And it kind of does this across the board. And then it creates a score from zero to one, which is what you saw on the other table, bins them into five groups. You can adjust the binning and, and you're good to go. And um, I think that's sort of the, the key to this. And uh, this quickly creating the models. And let's see what happens because the model 
is uh, embedded in in our world in our software, and it, it is here's an example of the, that math it just created. So it wrote in the entity table the score for attachment that has this math in it, which is what you just saw the summary of the other page. So this sustains, and um, in our world we update what's important here. This is not a when you do this, it shouldn't be a one-off study. It should be something that's done and sustains with your data. So in our case, every day we reload the data, all the factors, explanatory factors get updated, the scores get rerun, the people get rebinned, and they'll move quadrants if, if something's changed. Like if somebody joined a committee, um, came to a reunion, they're going to score higher after the weekend than they did going in, and they may bump up a category. So um, the other thing, just to we mentioned, but those explanatory factors, the, we call these, so the, the numbers of student activities is calculated in our world in the entity table. You saw the factor number of the student activities, but it's calculated by linking on ID to the student activities table. So there's another table that lists for every person who's had a student activity, what they all are. Same with giving, the same with committees. So we're doing these cross table calculations on ID, we put a one in each row that we sum it and we bring it back as an integer and a number with no decimal points. And um, the beauty of this in a discovery tool like this is it's Excel-like uh, macro language that's really easy to use. And you know, you can adjust this, uh, you could just, it's very easy to adjust and then you go down here and just save it. And then this pushes through everything and then it reloads the, the next day. I say this because a lot of these uh, models are, you're trying to get your hands on things that might indicate a engagement, attachment, interest, and it, you know you might not all be in your CRM. You might get a spreadsheet of newsletter click-throughs or some kind of a reunion survey, and you can quickly load another data set in uh, to the, our, our memory pool, create these cross-table explanatory factors, pop them into the model as an edit, rerun the model, and see if they matter, see if they make a difference. So that's uh, kind of the world of a lot of what we're doing. And the goal is to take all that raw data that's sitting in all those data tables and push it back up the quadrants, uh, that page where we saw the people with the projected amounts, and we saw the, the scores, but they were grouped into things that people could understand, like highly engaged. And then you quickly see why they're highly engaged. And in the, the scenario we ran through, we saw most of them weren't coming to committees, but they were giving consistently and coming to reunions. Okay, well, the next cultivation step would be the committee. So taking that data and getting into that form so you can slice through it and easily work with it empowers teams to kind of do this work on their own. And our whole mission here is to empower people and help um, them make better and faster fact-based decisions out of the pile of data that sits behind the scenes. And uh, kind of the high-level premise is there's a lot of data. It can help you raise more money, but it's hard to get at. It often causes a cycle of pain and a bunch of database calculations and structuring. And, you know, we're trying to create these Excel-like macro languages that uh, people who are at least familiar with the data or, or our team can do to help uh, get this in a form where it can be worked with uh, the fundraising teams. And that scenario... I ran through earlier is something we typically do with, with development officers in the room. We're talking because we have the, the people that look like most likely to be staffed with the factors for why right there. And you can spin through it from any angle. And it's they basically gets, you know, these stories and data div driven discussions going with a really collaborative approach, which is, I think we think the core to, to all of this. So that's sort of the, you know, from concept at the beginning on, how to lay data out to a run through of a scenario and then actually you know building out a model which we could then save and reuse um, what we wanted to communicate and so I'm going to uh, take time for some questions and uh, let's see what we got there's actually a modeling question uh, basically I'm going to paraphrase it but you quickly uh, went through the difference between a linear regression model and a classification model, you know, what are the differences? And I guess a, a related piece would be, are there other forms of modeling that make sense in fundraising? Um, I think, you know, my response would be the two 
basic modeling types that fit best in fundraising are linear regression and classification. There's a bunch of others. There's neural networks. There's all kinds of other things, but they're really not designed for this kind of problem solving. And between uh, a linear regression, you're trying to forecast a number, like forecast how much somebody might give. Uh, a classification is really a set membership example, which is what I ran through. You, know, you have a group of people, and you want to see how they compare to everybody else in a population. And that works for giving the way I did it. Certainly for you know alumni participation, it's either binary, like you either participate in a, um, a reunion or come to a club or you don't. So that would be where a classification model would be used. You would not use a linear regression. You can use a linear regression to forecast giving amounts, but it doesn't work particularly well with this hugely skewed data. And especially in major giving, you've got hugely skewed data. You've got a few people who make you know seven figure or maybe bigger gifts, and then you know a bunch of six figures, some a bunch, and even more five figures. So that problem is when you get that really long tail, it's tough for linear regression to do that. We actually recommend to forecast giving breaking it into the sub-pieces. In the case I show, we had capacity as one number, which could come from several sources. That was, that's another discussion. In attachment, and you, you combine them. And so you work the two factors separately and combine them. And that actually does a better do job of dealing with the skew because uh, you know, what skews it is the really high capacity. You have some people at 50 million plus, you know, 10 million plus, and there's not many of them. So the capacity number sort of handles that. And that's been researched and investigated. Um, where, you know, mid-level giving or lower-level giving, if you actually did a linear regression versus a classification, it'd be pretty comparable. So hopefully that helped answer it. What best practices are generally used to assign ratings on engagement and update ratings on engagement? Um, yeah, good question. Um, I first, uh, when we do this work, we're trying to brainstorm with the team to get a feel for what kinds of data is being collected that would indicate, you know, alignment, attachment, affinity, engagement, whatever the words are roughly comparable. And and uh, a best practice is just thinking through what it is that people might be doing that show an interest. And then the inf inference is the more interested they are, if they have capacity, the more likely they are to give to you versus somebody else. And, you know, Events obviously matters. Um, then you get into the next discussion. Uh, you know, is the event attendance being collected in a systematic way across the country at all the clubs or whatever the sub dimensions would be? Often it's not. And then that sort of sets a, 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 like a, a reason for why collecting that's important. Or another one is newsletter click-throughs are totally somebody expressing interest and then they're actually clicking on certain articles so they're telling you what they like. Usually that data is not being collected and stored anywhere. Uh, so, you know, the next step would be let's figure out from our sender, email sender, how do we actually get the downloads of that because it's really useful information for this kind of exercise. So, you know, one best practice is thinking through what sources of content do I have in some raw form? And then the next thing is how do I, you know, create it into X factors, uh, you know, for example, like event attendance by itself is, is not going to work. You've got like how many in the last six months, one year, you could even, then you need some flexibility to experiment with time periods. And um, that's probably the third one is discussions because, you know, the, the, the modeling does math, but you've got to get down into understanding causality. And does this actually make sense? And we've had like in the healthcare field, um, you do this work and one hospital location scores much lower than the others. The question is why? And there ought to be a reason. And in one case, yeah, there was a big PR issue because the hospital is trying to expand and take over something nearby that was getting people kind of riled in a negative way. Okay, that makes some sense. Um, you know, and we've had cases where, I've used this before, but you know, you're looking at factors behind somebody making a financial aid matching grant. And there's, uh, from a survey, there's a field called, you know, interest in financial aid or scholarship or something, and that comes out high. But in a discussion, somebody says, well, wait a minute, we made an adjustment for all the responses based on people's giving to financial aid. Uh, so that's no longer an independent factor and needs to come out. So this making sure it's just through discussion 
the factors make sense. Like that, the one I ran with the committees. Um, does it make sense that somebody who's been to four committees would have twice the connection as somebody in one, and nine would be three? It kind of does. You know, if it went the other way, if, if four was, you know, it was a square or something, so it was 16, that wouldn't make sense. I would say something's actually doesn't, this isn't sensible, what's going on. So the third one is just vetting this with a team. We see all too often these kinds of analytic exercises get thrown out to consultants who are smart and do good work, but they don't know the context. And if, if the modeling work is done out of context of the people who know the situation, uh, you can get um, not so accurate results. So we, we really like the discussion part of this and making sure that there's proper validation of causality and, um, and, and searching high and low to find all the things that might make a difference. I guess the fourth thing is embedding it in the system so it updates. Like we see a lot of this where stuff gets done and it's in a report or it's in a spreadsheet and it's not connected to the system so it doesn't update. I mean, this stuff is live. And quadrant A is going to be different today than in six months. And you want to really also pick up the people who have just moved up there. Uh, you know, it's that's that's the, somebody's moving. It's even it's even more important to make sure you you intercept them and engage with them and properly handle them in a portfolio. So I don't think it's right that this stuff, you know, often gets done, sits on the side in some spreadsheet or report that gets stale. It should be part of a system and be continually you know, updating and, and, and addressing the what, what's reality at the time. Yeah, how are you handling missing variables in the model? Uh, so that's a really good question. So if you have, for example, state as a field, and uh, there is, you know, California, Massachusetts, a bunch of them have missing missing in it. Our modeling will, ca will, will count missing. You can adjust it, but the default would be it counts it as a, uh, as a basically a state, a state that's missing, which could be international. So you might want that, but it's going to group them all together. That's okay if you have address data in like, you know, 10% of it's supposed to have a state, but it doesn't. Uh, those won't be scored, you know, properly, but it's not going to distort the others. But if it's like it's a lot and there's no meaning to it, the meaning is that you didn't get entered in the system, you didn't have it. That's going to distort the model. So it's sort of like a. So we handle it as a field, a factor. Uh, then this next question is: Is it meaningful? Like if it means international, it's meaningful and it's fine. If it means we missed it or we forgot to put it in the system, that's not good because those 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 ones are going to get rated differently only because somebody didn't put it in the system. There's no intrinsic meaning to missing. So that question has two parts. Um, mathematically, how do we handle it? And what's the missing you know, actually mean? Uh, how is the data partitioned in the model shown in this webinar? Uh, well, I'm not sure exactly what it means, but we, um, the way I ran the model was I ran it against one table entity and then so that table had one row for each person and then uh, we created those cross table factors from the other table so everybody had you know one value for your numbers of uh, committees and numbers of gifts and, and you know numbers of whatever um, you, we we in our app we actually have the other data so we could have gone back and run it against the committees table which would have had the names of the committees and it would have the output would have been those committees in that bar chart of degree of influence from positive to negative instead of you know the participation as a whole so I guess you know we, we're partitioning the data into it's in tables and then you know we're creating these cross table factors so we could have information about where there's a one to many, we collapse it to a one to one by creating your know, numbers of events last two years or committees, whatever, with the ability to go back to the detail table to figure out are they all the same, which that exercise, if, if I was to continue, it would have gone back to the committees table because that was like a big, it was over half the, half the, the influence uh, and want to break that apart. Got a nice long, uh, long question. Um, attachment weights in regards to assigning weights to the 
different types of attachments? Are you segmenting capacity, then figuring out the attachments for that population and using the specific attachment model for that population? Or is the attachment score being decided for the entire donor population as a whole? Ha ha. Yeah, so that question, there's another one on it. So the attachment scores, um, the model I ran scored the entire population of whatever it was, 55,000 people. Even though I, the, I cut the base down, the math ran against everybody. The, um, the, the, so we're, when we do this work, so for example, a large university that has an undergraduate college, a business school, a law school, uh, athletics, uh, a, a hospital, you can't, the weight, the models have to be done separately for those schools and parents and, and friends have to be modeled separately because the basic idea is they have to be able to have the same set of experience and experiences and express engagement or attachment in the same way. So in the case where there's a university with 17 separate cohorts, we would run separate models for and, and score the subset populations. So we would score the business school, it might have the same factors, but they're going to get very different weights than the undergraduate. Like business school people generally don't play sports. They probably don't come back to reunions, but they do give. There's probably regional events they come to. You know, the hospital side is, is different yet. I mean, you've got some events. Uh, you obviously don't have reunions uh, in, in some of the things that happen for the, the student uh, schools. So it's important. Parents obviously can't have the same experience as the uh, alums and uh, friends are different yet. So if that question means that, yeah, when we, I did a monolithic one fits all model, um, in reality, you'd want to create separate models because it doesn't, the people have to be able to show expression, express engagement or attachment in a similar way. And so if you take a, a large university in referencing, we actually ran, I think, 17 separate models. And then we created a composite score based on, so the still ran was zero to one, but it was based on separate math. Uh, for the business school versus the law school. So we actually had one attachment score. We bin people into the same high engaged owners engaged, but the rationale and the factors behind them uh, were different for each one. And then obviously the display pages, we had to have separate pages because the weightings of the factors were very different. Great question. It's another one. Uh, follow up. The attachment score is particular to the high versus medium versus low capacity populations. How are you deciding whether they are high or low attachment? Is the, limit, is the delimiter for the attachment dependent on the capacity population as well, or is it global? Are you anybody below or above a specific number is low? Yeah, that's, so that's a really good question. So um, we are generally doing what we did here, scoring major giving populations. If you then wanted to score, use the same model for annual giving, uh, it is more suspect, um, and it's harder to score the mass populations because um, you probably don't have as much capacity and whatnot. So that creating different attachment scores by capacity level, because um, now you get into, there's a bunch of factors why you might want to do that. Um, so technically, yes. I would say in practice, though, the weights and the factors aren't that different when we've been split the models apart. So we will often, as a proxy, use attachment from a major giving scoring model to score um, and, and create uh, projected amounts for annual giving. It's going to be at least dimensionally correct. I mean, because generally, if a school has a good reunion program and reunion coming to reunions causes more feeling of support, endorsement, it's going to work generally for everybody. Um, it might be that the major giving prospects are more likely to be because maybe they're more business senior oriented, whatever. They might be more on committees. So some of that will vary, but I guess I'm rambling. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's not completely the same. And ideally, you, you split the models apart. But we're sort of believers on it's better to get something out there that's directionally correct and start using it than to over overcomplicate the situation. So to counter that, the technical reality, yeah, you probably should have separate models is, but the problem is it becomes so confusing. The the major giving teams, the annual giving teams who need to use it can't figure out. And we've had examples where we have worked with teams to simplify overly complex models, uh, largely because uh, the teams 
couldn't understand him. And that's part of that language of, you know, highly engaged, engaged owners. People can talk about that, and it's a lot uh, easier than talking about, you know, score of 0.62 or 0.47 or 0.28. Uh, and, uh, you know, the where they come from, again, if we're directionally, this is all statistics, so it's directionally correct. It's, you know, never going to be perfect. Um, so I, I guess I, I agree with whoever made that comment, but you just got to be careful not to overcomplicate this thing. I'm clearly the one before, if you have 17 schools, you cannot weight the business school alums the same way as you do undergraduate alums. They just, they're not going to have, you're going to get really distorted low scores because they can't, they don't do the same things. And same thing with parents versus alums. I, that's so, enough on that one. Um, what is the best model to use to show engagement? What are the best indicators to put in a model to assign an engagement score? Yeah, uh, we sort of, the the thing I ran was missing events. It's a demo data set. So, but typically it's like committee participation uh, where they're engaged in some cause for something they're interested in is, is always a factor. You're coming to events, uh, which is not for profits in healthcare and higher ed, uh, giving consistently, uh, you know, higher ed example, we typically use your know, last five and then six to 10. If it's healthcare or not profits, you might shorter the time period last two, maybe three to five because you don't have the consistent history. Um, the Those things, and there's something about the undergraduate experience, you know, activities, sports, maybe Greek participation, depending on the school. Those are the consistent things that, that score high. Um, my newsletter click-throughs, are also an indicator, but very few people are, are actually getting that from their mail senders. So, yeah, that's another one I would throw in. Um, does the advisor database work with the BlackBot products, especially NXT? Hey, great question, awesome. We just are launching an NXT extractor. We, we're a BlackBot technology partner. We've done a bunch of development work with them to get the data out of NXT, and it's working. Uh, it, it's working fast. We get almost all the tables now. Uh, there's been a ton of work there between us, two companies, in the last year. So, yeah, NXT is actually pretty awesome because we can get the data out. We can plop it down anywhere. We've got one client. We're plopping it into our cloud. We've got another client. We're plopping it on-premise and, and merging it with patient data. Um, and, you know, when we plop the data down, it, it's just text files. So reporting systems that are there can use it and other systems. So, yeah, that's great. Most of these systems, like um, working on BlackBot CRM when it's hosted, uh, we'll work, that'll be soon. And Lucy in the same way. I mean, getting this stuff out of their new CRM advance is not a problem. We're, we're working with them. We're technology partners with Lucian as well. Obviously, the on-premise databases, we're just pulling from SQL Server, Oracle spreadsheets. But yeah, we're, we're as a company committed to making it easy to get the data out. But the NXT question was kind of a layup because we just we just finished the work and we're packaging it up. And it, it's, it's, it's just, you know, it's set on a script. It just kicks off at night, drops the data down somewhere automatically. You don't have to do anything. And there it all is. I see question yay. <laughs> I like that one. Uh, good answers. How's the software different from SAS? Yeah, so um, a bunch of questions like that. Uh, so our modeling math, we, we benchmarked it against SAS, SPSS, R, which would probably be the three. Uh, there's also Python has modeling language in it. Uh, from an accuracy standpoint, we're all very comparable. Uh, we're, we're pretty fast, so from a speed perspective, we're equal to better than them. Uh, what we try to differentiate on is the ease of use. So our, our idea is somebody who understands data and can write Excel macros and, and can, ought to be able to do modeling. And you, know, you saw me build a model in like a minute. Uh, that's literally the thought process, that it's easy to adjust and saves it. If you try to do that in SAS uh, or SPSSR, uh, it's a lot more complex. You need more stats background. And you've also got the issue of somebody's got to do a bunch of data formation in front of it where we actually suck in all those tables and they run in memory on RAM and it's very easy to create, you know, the cross table calculations like I showed, uh, just simple Excel macro like uh, equations and they're very easy to adjust. And, um, and we also can push, like if you create the stuff in Advisor, we can push it back out to the database or to a reporting tool. So you can use us as a sandbox calculating your know, data mart engine, uh, display it like I did, slice and dice it, or just export stuff back out. Which is another question is how do you guys differ from Tableau or Power BI? It's 
it's the in-memory capability. I mean, those two are more dashboard tools that sit on top of a more formatted database. You cannot create cross-table calculations, uh, do modeling, and spin through the metrics you know, the way I showed a few minutes ago. So yeah, there's uh, primary differences. You know, we're, in a, we're in a field called data discovery and analytics, which is different than reporting and dashboards. Uh, reporting and dashboards are like Microsoft Reporting Services, Tableau, Power BI, all that. They do a good job there, but they're not particularly good at letting you slice and dice, spin through, play around with metrics, build models, and all of that. That's our world. Um, and that is also the world of a SAS, R, Python, SPSS, but those are more programming oriented. So we're trying to hit this middle ground of, you know, fundraisers who are data somewhat savvy and can do something in Excel and empower them. Uh, and we, we, you know, we obviously help set this stuff up. So like loading in the Razor's Edge NXT tables and building models out of it, we usually set it up and then it's like you have this big Excel workbook, uh, which is then you can just modify stuff. It's pretty easy at that point. But yeah, we usually we usually help get the 30 uh, NXT banner, uh, Blackboard, Serum, Millennium, Agilon, Salesforce, whatever they are, tables in and working together right. So a lot of good questions. Looks like we might have cleared cleared the docket. I'm getting uh, somebody's like helping me understand what more questions there are. Okay, we cleared the docket of questions. Uh, this thing has been recorded. Uh, we'll have it up and out within the week. And uh, thank you for your time today. And uh, you can know how to reach us if you want to follow up. And there's uh, some additional resources up there on this, our tutorial page, which is there. This where this one will be once we get it uh, up and posted. So thanks, and have a great afternoon.